Good evening, y'all, and welcome to this uh, much anticipated uh, second part of our uh, DPRK presentation. I'm uh, very glad y'all are here with me tonight. Um, I'll be presenting uh, a PowerPoint presentation to y'all where we'll be learning more about uh, what the DPRK has been through in um, modern times, to finding that as more or less what's going on since about 1988 to the present. If you are watching via the YouTube stream uh, and not watching live, the uh, PowerPoint presentation will be in the description so that you can follow along uh, that way. Without further ado, let's get into our the DPRK in Modern Times presentation. So uh, we'll be talking about what I was able to break down to four different aspects of the DPRK, and that's going to be the USSR and the DPRK, surviving natural disasters, resisting imperialism, and growing strong. Those are the aspects we'll be discussing in regards to the DPRK. So let's get right into the collapse of the USSR and the DPRK. So one thing that I found interesting as I was doing my research um, is this concept of friendship crisis that was a uh, strongly benefiting the DPRK while it was able to maintain its relationship with uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, friendship prices were a large contributing factor to the North Korean economy. Um, now, friendship prices allowed the DPRK to purchase uh, material goods from the USSR, such as petroleum and oil, and they were actually able to do that for 25% of the actual market price. And it, it's important to note that the friendship crisis actually ended two to three years before the collapse of the Soviet Union, depending on the source. Uh, some sources say that it, uh, the friendship crisis stopped in 1988, and others have it stopping in 1989. But either way, the friendship crisis did eventually cease in, uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that obviously had a detrimental uh, effect on the DPRK. In addition to the friendship crisis, the USSR also sent food aid to the DPRK, largely attributed to the U.S. having rendered the DPRK growing its own food difficult. But it's important to note that while the U.S. made it difficult for the DPRK to grow its own food, they didn't make it outright unfeasible. Uh, the DPRK was still able to grow food, but the bombing campaign, the Korean War, uh, rendered the crops um, just barren. Uh, it was hard to store the land barren. It was hard to grow crops, but like I said, not impossible. Um, there isn't even really good data to show how much food the USSR was providing to the DPRK, but it's important to note, um, and I didn't, I don't know why I didn't write it down here, but in 1997 to 1998, during, uh, during the flooding period, the DPRK was provided by the Soviet Union upwards of uh, 4.7 billion, 4.7 million uh, tons of food. So even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a uh, continued food aid. Uh, to the DPRK from Russia. Uh, one of the most horrifying aspects that I found of the collapse of the USR was the problem with electricity uh, in the DPRK. Um, the DPRK had a hard time running freight trains to the uh, rural areas in order to get food out to the peasantry. And, that's a, and that was a large contributing factor to the fact. And so knowing that, it is then, comrades, obviously woefully inadequate uh, to speak about food shortages without mentioning this. Uh, it's not that they were so composedly, they're not, it's not that they were like trying to starve their people on purpose or anything of the sort. It's literally their largest coal um, trader at the time, you know, provider of electricity, was literally no longer in existence. And they were having a hard time getting out to the rural areas in order to get food out to the peasantry. And we'll talk about how horseshit, well, you'll see just how horseshit the idea that they were purposely starving people is. Uh, as we get to this next section on uh, surviving natural disasters. Let's talk about the floods of the 90s. So the floods of the 90s obviously had a devastating impact on the DPRK, affecting, affecting as much as 30% of the country. Regions were seeing rains of 877 millimeters in seven hour stretches. Um, the flow from the Amnok River along the Korea and China border was 4.8 billion tons, comrades, 4.8 billion tons of rain. Uh, along the Korea-China border. Uh, flooding to that extent hadn't been recorded in 70 years to that time. Um, grain reserves were destroyed, 
estimates coming in at about 1.5 million tons. And that comes from liberal bourgeois uh, estimates uh, from institutions like the CDC and whatnot. The numbers could have been even worse than that, for all we know. And speaking of the devil, to make matters worse, even the CDC estimated that 1.2 million grain, uh, tons of grain production was lost. Now, that accounted for about 12% of 1995's uh, grain production, y'all. So just imagine losing 12% of uh, your grain production in a single year. It's devastating. So desperation for food got so bad enough that there are stories about people who would eat the, uh, the maize cobs before uh, full development. And that resulted in something along the lines of a decrease in the harvest of 50%. So, you know, that's why it's nonsense to talk about this idea of, oh, you know, brutal authoritarian, um, greedy communists in the DPRK choosing not to feed their people. No, it's way less simplistic than that. There are all kinds of awful material conditions that are compounding together to make it hard uh, on, the, on the people living in the north so let's move on resisting imperialism so it isn't just natural disaster that led to the material conditions that dprk is forced to recover from y'all so the citizens of the dprk are often forced to engage in one-sided trades in order to get access to necessities one example of the above is how wheat is sanctioned because ease of access to wheat is strictly prohibited by the u.s and by south korea uh, people living in the north trade cow tails for grain often this makes it much more difficult to raise healthy cattle. Um, the U.S. has required that anyone who contributes to the nuclear weapons program of the DPRK must be sanctioned. South Korea even banned inter-Korean trade, except at the Kaesong Industrial Zone. And that further alienates people in the North from getting the resources that they need. And Japan even went as far as banning ships that have ever visited North Korea even once from entering Japan. And that further obviously alienates the country from the global economy. So when we talk about the kind of conditions that the DPRK is subject to and like the logic that goes into why the uh, country on the world stage uh, behaves in the way it does. It's not the musings of some mad authoritarian dictator, um, uh, totalitarian dictator. It's quite literally the logical progression of how the global uh, imperialists treat the North. It's, it's quite logical that they behave in the way that they do, given all these different things that we're bringing up. But they're still growing strong, as we'll, as we'll see here. So as of 2017, North Korea's GDP growth was still 4%. In 2021, North Korea is projected to see 0.5% growth, even after contradictions caused by the global pandemic. The unemployment rate is down to the lowest it's been in the country at 3.3%. In 2019, exports rose 14.4% and enjoyed a strong boot from uh, clock and watch manufacturing. Housing is virtually free in the DPRK. And that's, these, are, these are all just facts about the growth in the country that I was able to uh, put into this uh, PowerPoint presentation. I mean, the girth of information that I was able to find about the DPRK would have had me having to break this down into two or three different presentations to really cover, you know, how great, uh, well, not, not to use the word great, but just how, how uh, well DPRK is managing to resist and recover in the face of imperialism. So uh, these are some of the facts about the country. Uh, so that's, that's just a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to link this article in the chat, and I want to uh, we'll, we'll discuss it. I'll get Emily to pull this article up on, her, on the screen. It's from the Globe and Mail, and it's, and it's aid, su aid groups suffer under North, Korean, uh, under North Korean sanctions. And we'll read that, and this will get further. Uh, we'll be able to further see just how badly uh, people in the, in the region suffer as a result of the logic of imperialism. Uh, let me get this to Emily real quick, and then y'all can follow along on, on her screen. Let's see. And of course, I'll get this uh, article put into the um, into the description for those who are going to be following along on the YouTube channel as well. So it's real. So eight groups suffering under North Korean sanctions. Over the four years 
he spent living and working in North Korea. Thomas Fisler grew accustomed to two realities. One from outside the country showed harsh new international measures meant to choke the North Korea economy. The other, visible in Pyongyang's stores and across the country side, showed almost no discernible evidence that sanctions were having any effect. Shops remained stocked with fridges and electric bikes. Mr. Uh, Fizzler could glimpse large foreign currency bills and the wallets of middle-class people in Pyongyang, some of them making daily use of taxis. That, at $3 US a ride, would have been unaffordable a decade ago. The price of rice has gone unchanged. Rural farmers continue their business largely unaffected. Amid the tensions provoked by North Korea's test of nuclear devices and intercontinental ballistic missiles, the international community retaliated with increasingly strict new sanctions. Mr. Fisler led the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation in Pyongyang before leaving in October. His time here there gave him some of the lengthiest recent experience in North Korea among foreigners. Outside Pyongyang, these people are living on subsistence. Anyhow, there is literally no trade, Mr. Fessler said. And in Pyongyang, the shopping malls are as full as ever. There was just one major exception, humanitarian work, which has come, come under severe pressure in North Korea, Mr. Uh, Fessler and the United Nations are awarded. It is not clear where the goods stocking Pyongyang stores are coming from, although roughly 90% of, of North Korea's foreign trade comes from China, which has said that it is enforcing sanctions but does not have a formal presence at the Vancouver, uh, Vancouver summit this week. The high profile of restrictions against North Korea has caused some companies to cease all trade with the isolated country for fear of accidentally coming in contact with some sanctioned item that could have them fall afoul of authorities and harm their business elsewhere, Mr. Fisler said. Inside North Korea, fuel prices have nearly doubled, but those prices seem to apply largely to international organizations, Mr. Fisler said. Private cars remain rare, while military and government fleets appear to have the right to buy at a lower price. International agencies, meanwhile, have also been hit hard by the closing of banking channels to North Korea. Mr. Fisler had little choice but to enter the country with as much as $300,000 in cash left into his carry-on luggage. Larger organizations are in worse shape, he said, in particular the United Nations agency with larger budgets. In the current climate, they have severe difficulties to keep operational. There is no doubt, Mr. Fisher said, Mr. Fisler said. UN agencies have experienced trouble bringing vaccines and powdered milk into North Korea, Mr. Fisler said, despite clear exemptions uh, for such materials. Representatives of the UN have begged their committee in charge of sanctions to emphasize that humanitarian goods should not be affected by international measures. A UN official confirmed Mr. Fisler's account, speaking on condition of anonymity because of the sensitivity of the matter. Crucial Relief items have been held up for months, despite having correct paperwork, the official said. The financial issues have significantly threatened the UN's ability to continue humanitarian operations in North Korea. The UN has tried to compensate by buying goods and paying salaries outside the country, the official said. Private charities have struggled against similar roadblocks. This week, First Steps, a Canadian charity, charity that provides nutritional supplements to North Korean women and children, released a video up here. Increasingly severe sanctions are increasing uh, suffering, the video says. Shouldn't we create a space to fast track humanitarian aid? Mr. Fisler believes sanctioning nations must pay more attention to humanitarian needs in North Korea. He supports trade measures as long as they are used as a tool toward reviving talks and believes they will eventually have an effect in North Korea, perhaps by forcing, quote, the government to put infrastructure improvements on hold, being transport systems, railroads, or power lines. But he said, the North Korean government has used sanctions to rally support at home by, quote, telling everyone that the evil U.S. imperialists are responsible for what happens, and so we've got to sit together closer and go through tougher times. Mr. Fisler said, and that's what they do. They are fairly stoic in saying, we've had sanctions over many years, let them be tougher. It doesn't bother us. He warns, however, that placing North Korea 
and a vice that becomes too tight could press the country into more quote unquote illegal actions like the drug trade, methamphetamine. They can make billions with that. Easy. Or fake currency, he said. If they are pushed to the edge to the san- with these sanctions, it will backfire. So we have here a literal telling of the logic of imperialism and how it's playing out in the DPRK to this day, talking about what was the quote at the end, pushing the country to the edge of, of sanctions or to get harsher, the will of the Korean people being on display where they quite literally proclaim that they've already been under sanctions for some time, so that in mind is what they can make them as tough as they want because the Korean people will prevail. Um, will prevail. Um, and that's to say nothing of what quote-unquote humanitarian aid when it comes from the UN even means. They will quite literally use the guise of humanitarian aid, smuggle actors into your country who, whose sole purpose it is is to spread propaganda and help to destabilize the country. So these are the uh, sort of things that the DPRK uh, is having to push back against and resist. And even in this article, they're detailing like, what the conditions inside the country are actually like, despite the logic of imperialism. They talked about doubling uh, fuel, but only for international organizations and how local actors are still allowed to uh, purchase those resources at a much larger rate. So they're literally acting in a way to try to push the forces of imperialism out of their country by making it harder for the forces of imperialism to operate within the country. So these are the real, you know, material things that are on the minds of the DPR, uh, the people living in the DPRK when the country is discussed. And it is of the utmost importance that we, uh, we keep these things in mind. Even so when in my, in my research for this, even neoliberal uh, media like Vox was reporting on uh, North Koreans' economy growing. And obviously they were using neoliberal framework, uh, but they were even uh, talking about it as recently as May 2017. Um, the North Korean economy is actually growing despite sanctions. It's quiet embrace, but their framing is it's quiet embrace of free markets has helped the country survive sanctions. And it talks about how, according to the Times, some experts estimate that the North economy, that the North Korean economy, could be growing anywhere between one and five percent per year, and that if North Korea's economy is actually growing at the higher end of that estimate, that the country would be showing surprising resilience in the face of international sanctions. And I'll link that uh, to Emily, who can then share it with y'all uh, here in Bread Theory. But yeah, it's even neoliberals cannot necessarily deny what is actually happening in the country in terms of its growth. Uh, and obviously neoliberals being neoliberals, they'll always try to use the logic of neoliberalism to try to give that uh, credence and why we're seeing growth in the country. But um, this is just not the case. Uh, neoliberal reforms can't explain how they can manage to price out uh, imperialist forces in the country from gas while at the same time being able to keep it uh, affordable for the Korean military. The forces of neoliberalism can't explain that the virtual free housing um, in the DPRK. Um, they can't explain the continued increase, um, decrease in the unemployment rate um, in the country. They can't even explain uh, something um, along the lines of why it is that the country um, has is able to prosper despite people having to go as far as um, trading cow tails for wheat and leaving them uh, unable to uh, to raise their cattle in a healthy way. So these are the real conditions, comrades, that the DPRK is dealing with. But as we can see, the country is uh, managing to survive and and get get by despite the logic of uh, imperialism trying to crush the country. Uh, So that's the, uh, in terms of the articles that I had and what I wanted to present to y'all, uh, that's the presentation, and now I want to go ahead and open it up to questions. Uh, did anybody have any questions? If you did, go ahead and type stack in the chat, and I'll get to your questions. <laughs> Aaron asked, what did he need 300K in cash for? That's a good point. That's a good question. When I was reading that part, I was just like, what the fuck are you doing smuggling 300K? And, well, not smuggling, but bringing 300K in cash for as in. And what exactly is it you're planning on doing with that kind of money once you're even inside the country? Like, that's a little ridiculous. Uh, Lepkin says, I guess if he was planning to stay a while, while well, he had to ensure he had enough. Could also be other reasons, but that just be speculation on my part. I mean, I don't think, 
you need three hundred thousand dollars, comrade, to to stay a while. But hey, you know, maybe what that person needs and what people like us need to, you know, get by for a little while are totally different. So Aaron asks, I might ask a question about the elephant in the room. How do we account for the dynasty of three uh, generations of leaders? This is a disingenuous question. So no, that's a fine question. So let's talk. And I, and I wrestled back and forth about whether or not to even talk about the governmental structure of the DPRK in terms of the actual presentation. Um, but I decided, yeah, let's just keep it to what's going on in terms of the presentation for, uh, and, and the DPRK uh, for the presentation. But we can definitely talk about that. So let's talk about the so-called dynastic nature of uh, the DPRK. So as we talked about in... For part one, uh, there was all kinds of brutality that the DPRK was subjected to before and leading up to the world uh, to World War uh, Two and to its independence. Let me pull that up and cite some of that stuff for y'all so that I can remind our comrades here just exactly what kind of uh, brutality the DPRK was subjected to. So. Japan was colonizing the country. Uh, it had increased its presence in the country, uh, forming a coalition between northern and southern jihad groups. And with the force of up to 200 Kray, they were, they crushed the, uh, they were able to crush the uh, Korean rebels of the, uh, of, from, and the Gobu Revolt, the treaty, that, and, when, and eventually the uh, Koreans did get their independence in 1895. But, this independence necessarily came um, with further increase in the presence of Japanese uh, colonizers uh, in the region. Um, the U.S. even entered a secret agreement to formally recognize each other's claims to the Philippines and Korea, respectively. These are things we went over in the first presentation. In 1905, Korea became a proctorate of Japan, and in 1910, um, it was officially annexed by Japan. And that followed struggle by the Korean righteous armies who engaged in thousands of skirmishes with Japanese forces, especially from 1907 to 1908. These are the real things they were dealing with. And I'm, and I'm, I'm giving all this history, but I'm going to tie it back to the question you asked about the dynastic, the so-called dynastic nature of, of, of Korea over the, over the last little while. So anyway, so that's what's going on in the country. The Korean righteous armies are struggling. When they end up becoming, um, Korea ends up becoming a proctorate of Japan in 1910. Um, Japan begins to restrict aspects of Korean culture. They institute colonial schools to teach the Japanese language, as well as restrict the allowability of speaking Korean. These are the real things that are actually happening inside Korea. Uh, imperial Japanese institutions uh, even start teaching that Korean was a lesser developed variant of Japanese, literally doing the equivalent of Aryan race science uh, in, the, in their propagandizing against uh, Korean people. Uh, the Japanese began partitioning the land. They rewrite laws to turn Korean peasants into tenant farmers of the Japanese rule. And Koreans are forced to portion out food down to the square inch of each plot, comrade. Uh, and so th these are the conditions they're dealing with. So Japanese monopolize the cotton and the rice. And the Koreans survive on barley and millet. Uh, and that's denied. Uh, and, they, and they get denied access to their own damn fisheries. There are peaceful protests that get crushed. And it ends with the uh, night uh, and are violently ended, such as with the uh, 1919 March 1st protest that sees uh, 7,500 Koreans massacred. More examples of Japanese brutality, uh, if we even need them, um, are such as 1923. 6,000 Korean and Japanese socialists get killed after the Great Keno earthquake, supposedly in response to rumors about a... a about a Korean conspiracy. That's the, that's the logic that they're using. So in addition to all that happening at the same time, that, that's happening, the USSR eventually acts to help end Japanese occupation of the Korean Peninsula. And this uh, made the US feel pressure to try to stop, and stop Soviet influence throughout the uh, region. So now the US begins to practice this policy of containment of communism. And now we're talking about the uh, late 30s and early 40s. Uh, and even into the mid 40s. In uh, Imperial Japan, I outsourced, it outsourced a lot of the labor um, to Korea and to the USSR, and the United States saw that as an opportunity to tap into the Korean labor force uh, in order to develop their own productive forces. 
The U.S. also thought that it could be possible to reestablish Japanese rule in the region as such. And um, they also thought that they could rule Korea through proxy by having Japan established in the region so that they could have access to the vast textile industry Japan outsourced and forced Korea to develop. Um, so these are, again, the conditions that Korea is dealing with. So we can see that the logic of imperialism causes the U.S. intervention in the country as well as the preemptive response to protect interest in Korea by the Soviets. The U.S. bisection of the uh, Korea Venezuela, Japanese surrender to the USSR in the North and the USA in the South. The U.S. responds to the indigenous government with the occupation government, which Koreans oppose, obviously. And then building to the uh, Korean War even more, Kim Un Sung and his supporters organized a socialist uh, government in 1945 in Seoul, and it's called the People's Republic of Korea. Kim Il Sung tried to push support for an all Korea election, an election of all Koreans in August of 1950 and proposed a consultative conference that would have taken place in June that e of that year ahead of the election. But Sigmund Rhee rejects this proposal. So while um, Kim Il-sung is pushing for an all, uh, a, a, a totally democratic process that includes all Korean people, uh, Sigmund Rhee is totally against this in both theory and in praxis. Uh, Kenneth C. Royal and John Muccio uh, theorized with Sigmund Rhee that people from the northern region of Korea were demoralized and would switch sides if civil war were to break out. So they're wrapping up the logic of imperialism and its propaganda to gear up for war against imperialism. So the UN begins recognizing the South um, and stipulated the legitimate rule of the South over the entire peninsula. And it's important to remember, comrades, that the war itself was a civil war until American interference, as Korea had been one nation for a thousand years, a thousand years, y'all. And then the Soviet uh, occupation of the North and U.S. occupation of the South meant a military clash was inevitable. Soviets provide bomber planes, medical supplies, and food to the DPRK to prepare for what they perceived uh, to be kind of an inevitable conflict, and their cynicism definitely proved correct. So then the Korean War starts. U.S. dropped 635,000 tons of bombs and other explosives on the DPRK, including almost 33,000 tons of napalm. Uh, 33,000 tons of napalm, comrade. Like, that's absurd. To put this in a greater context and to understand how brutal this was, that's the U.S. dropped 503,000 uh, tons of bombs in the entirety of its Pacific campaign during World War II. And yet, it dropped 635,000 tons of bombs and explosives on the, on the DPRK. It's, more, it's, it's a lot more than its entire Pacific campaign during the war, during its, during its four years in, the, in World War II. 20% of the DPRK's population was killed off. So that's, how, that's the brutality we're talking about. There's more cities destroyed in the DPRK at the hands of the, U than, of the U.S. than there were in Japan and Germany. Sigmund Rhee uh, rounded up communists from both the North and the South, and he did so under the guise of re-education. And they justified this method by claiming it was an alternative to execution. Communist sympathizers were also rounded up to fill out the ranks of the Bodo League. This was known as the National Bodo League. So this is the material reality that the people uh, in the North are dealing with, uh, Comrade Aaron. So when we talk about dynastic, uh, the, the, the so-called dynastic uh, nature of the DPRK. Let's keep those material conditions in mind. So then let's go back to your, um, your original question. Your question was how to account for the dynasty of three generations of leaders. This isn't a disingenuous question. Did they feel like they needed to keep it in order to uh, family to maintain, to maintain control? So now that we know the material conditions that are on the minds of the Koreans, now we can start to address this idea of what the dynastic nature of the last three generations of Korean leaders. So first and foremost, it is important to note that the uh, process for coming into uh, government in the DPRK is completely democratic. There is a convention, and even though you hear about these so-called single party ballots, it is, or the single um, person ballots, it is completely disingenuous. The actual process for being in power in the DPRK is as follows. You go to a convention. Every person who is able in the DPRK uh, in terms of the citizenship 
uh, is required to uh, be at these conventions. At these conventions, they debate. They argue amongst each other about this candidate and that candidate, and they confirm which candidates they want and which candidates they don't want. And if the candidate is not chosen, then that person is pushed to the side and another person is presented. When they get to the so-called single ballot, this isn't a totalitarian state trying to push its candidates on people. This is literally a confirmation of the, of the Democratic Convention that had already taken place. So when you talk about the, uh, the ooms, um, they are also at this very same convention democratically decided. So then you might ask, well, okay, but why is it that they seem to continue to get into a, to office despite this um, supposed democratic process? But the answer is quite clear. There's, there's nothing dynastic about it. The, the family has helped uh, lead the country to some level of economic growth and continuing to survive and quite literally exist uh, for 76 years now. These people are popular, not because they're conscripted to be popular, but because they have quite literally helped the country continue to survive and prosper in the face of the material conditions inflicted on them by the logic of imperialism, whether it be at the hands of colonial Japan, China's not innocent in this, the Soviet Union's lack of existence, the U.S. is imperialism on a um, that it that it um, that it inflicts on the DPRK. Obviously, imperialism at the hands of uh, the occupied South. This is uh, these are the real material conditions. So these people are rightfully seen as heroes in the region, and it is most it is it is completely logical that these people would easily um, win elections. It's 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 no different than expecting George Washington. Um, and his offspring to be popular in the uh, you know in the direct aftermath of the uh, Korean or, or, or the Revolutionary War. Obviously, he would be popular, and anybody bearing the name who happened to be his namesake would be popular too. If our country happened to uh, operate in the same way the DPRK does, so it's, it's it's not that it's dynastic, comrade. It's quite literally the logic of imperialism and those in that family helping uh, the North uh, resist imperialism that leads to organic popularity. But if it should ever be the case that the family is no longer popular and um, being able and riding the wave of popularity that comes from having helped the country resist the forces of imperialism, the country, the, they won't stay in power because the process will quite literally not allow them to stay in po uh, power. But when you look at improved conditions for the North, when the North has to look at the housing market all over the world compared to the fact that they have access to free health care, when they have access to free housing, when they have access to all these material goods, it is a little surprise that the uh, family continues to remain in power and to be popular. But it's an open question as to whether that will always be the case, you know, but it's only been 76 years since the Korean War. That's recent history. That's not that long ago. There are very much living Koreans who would have fought in, in, in World War II and in the Korean War. Uh, you know, so that's recent memory, and it'll be recent memory uh, for the foreseeable future. So as long as uh, it's true that the uh, people appreciate the contributions of the family to help and um, keep the country quite literally in existence and unoccupied by the U.S., despite the U.S.'s uh, veiled attempts to do so, yeah, they'll continue to get elected. But it is very democratic. It couldn't be more, well, I, could, I won't say it couldn't be more democratic, but it's sure, hell, it's sure as hell a hell of a lot more democratic than anything that goes on in this country, comrade. So that's the answer uh, to that question. No problem. Uh, did that make sense to you, comrade? No, I hope so. And if you have any other questions, you know, don't hesitate to ask. If anybody else has any questions, there's a good time to go ahead and put them out there. And I'll get you all some uh, sources, too. And they'll be in the YouTube um, video. And they'll also be, and I'll, and I'll even make sure to tag everybody after I link them here, because I don't want to make it seem as if there's no sources on this stuff. This, I just didn't happen to include them in this presentation. But it's not of any surprise that that particular question uh, came up. So it's really not a big deal for me to source uh, how the government structure and the DPRK works. Uh, I see Lecton is typing, so I'll allow him to finish saying what he's going to say. He says, do you know any idea, do you have any idea of the general attitude of the South uh, to the North? So 
that's a really interesting question. The South is very much propagandized about the North. They are told that people in the North live less freely than those who in the, those in the South live. They are told uh, that their people in the um, North are brainwashed and unable to think critically um, for themselves. It's actually quite able as the propaganda that um, is perpetrated. But it is important to note that the propaganda spread in the South isn't even necessarily of, of South Korean making, but it's, I mean, it's a, the South is occupied by the U.S., whether the U.S. wants to call it an official occupation or not. And the propaganda that we hear against our comrades in the North is quite literally U.S. imperialistic propaganda. And, you know, uh, a strong hint of Japanese propaganda in there as well. So while it is true that the, um, that the sentiment that you hear coming out of the South isn't particularly favorable, that is literally propaganda being kicked up by the U.S. military, the CIA, and every other kind of imperialistic force that you uh, could even imagine. I mean, you get people who flee from the North into the South and then end up reporting later that everything that they ever learned about the South uh, was confirmed when they fled to the South. That it really is an occupied country, that the people there are the ones that are actually brainwashed by U.S. Uh, military propaganda, and that the people in the South live less freely than the people in the North do. So that's uh, the answer to your question there, Lecter. Or at least that's the answer to that part of the question. I see you're still uh, typing. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just really important to, uh, to note who exactly is spreading what propaganda when we hear horseshit rhetoric coming out from the people, from the citizenry. Because, you know, technically speaking, the South is a colonized country too, man. The U.S. you know, are the fucking colonizers. But the framing of imperialism doesn't necessarily allow them to frame to frame it that way. But uh, it is a, the 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 North is very much aware that the uh, that the people of the South are being colonized, and they, generally speaking, wish nothing more than complete solidarity and, and, and union with the South, and one day being one country again. You know, but. As long as the logic of imperialism plays out, that unfortunately won't be happening. But that is one of the principal goals of any uh, anti-imperialist uh, communist anyway. So, similarly, what do you know their thoughts about a potential reunification of the peninsula? Yeah, no, I, I, I probably doing my rant just unintentionally ended up going into that. Uh, but yeah, there aren't many Koreans who aren't in favor of... Uh, Unif or of unification. Uh, I actually found some uh, data on that. Um, let's see. Where is that article? There we go. So a total of 54% of respondents in this Carn uh, Carnegie survey said that, or I'm sorry, 60.5% of respondents said that the U.S. would um, likely have the most influence through a reunification process. And... 69% felt that the Korea should be unified without foreign intervention. 57.2% of those opposed foreign who, who uh, opposed foreign involvement believed that it would undermine the independence and the sovereignty. And at the same time, 49.5% of those who did not feel that unification should be a wholly Korean process without interference only feel that way because they believe that foreign powers would inevitably be involved in one way or another. And so there's and so what the uh, results of this uh, are saying is that they it would it would be a more peaceful process if they just relented to letting there be foreign involvement as opposed to resisting. Uh, when South Koreans think about unification, forty point five percent say that they think peaceful coexistence is the most likely outcome. Thirty one point six percent say peaceful unification through dialogue and negotiations is the most probable end game. So you have over 71% of South Koreans, you know, in one way or another, who think peaceful unification is a likely goal of, or, or is a likely outcome of trying to pursue um, unification with the North. And this is, this is data coming from the South. Despite South Korea's growing ties with China, only 26.9% of South Koreans trust China to be a supportive partner in unification. Um, so that's something being worked out. But yeah, uh, it's, it's very clear that some South Koreans are profoundly interested in a unification process. There are so there there are holdups about 
there being a unification process at all is whether or not uh, there will be foreign intervention. And to what extent there is hesitation uh, depends on who you ask and what their opinions are on what foreign actors will be uh, intervening in the unification process. So let me get that uh, to Emily who will post it here for y'all as well. Yeah. So y'all can read that Carnegie article that has that discusses South Korean public opinion of unification of outside powers. And that's not an old article. That is from May 13th, 2020. You know, so this is just last year in the midst of the pandemic. Um, so that's the real uh, situation in terms of what the South, uh, what people in the South think about the idea of unification. So any idea that people in the region are not interested in solidarity, complete horseshit and totally based in ahistoricism and not based in material reality at all. That's just the truth of the matter. And of course, every article that I'm citing here, I'll obviously make sure is in the description and the, uh, in the YouTube video. Folks in the South probably remember stuff about the USSR being involved in a process that ended up disrupting their uh, unification. Yeah, you know, I could do, I should do some studying on exactly why the South's attitudes about foreign intervention in the process are as they are, because that would be a good thing for us to discuss, and we can come back to it later. I would love to have that discussion with y'all, because uh, understanding what, why the people in the South feel as they feel would get us a hell of a lot closer to understanding what this process of unification will have to look like in order for most Koreans, both in the South and the North, to consent to the process. So any country with a strong ideological push would uh, be problematic to them. Yeah, I could agree with that. If there are or any more questions, now's a good time to go ahead and ask them, y'all. I am definitely an open book on this subject. It's not a problem. Really enjoying hanging out with y'all. It's been a while. I uh, appreciate this turnout. Uh, I see Aaron is typing, so I'll allow their thoughts to be uh, shared. What is it going on with the people who escaped writing books and doing anti-DPRK stuff? Uh, and do anti-DPRK stuff. So, this is, what is going on with the people who escaped writing books and doing anti-DPRK stuff? Some of uh, which has been shown to be lies. It's a very complicated process. These uh, these so-called defectors. Oftentimes, we end up finding out that the defectors are paid state actors. No, you're okay. Uh, you don't no need to apologize, Aaron. We end up finding out that these people are paid. Oftentimes, the equivalent of U.S. $2,000 uh, in order to uh, say whatever it is uh, that the um, state wants them to say about the DPRK. So it's not that you should dismiss what these defectors say. It's that you have to really take a look into uh, who these defectors are and what it is they're saying and who has it and, and, and who is publishing um, their words because oftentimes you'll find out that it was a state actor, you know, paying them a lot of money to uh, to say whatever it is that you're hearing. I mean, there's a whole TV show in the South uh, made of coerced defectors who were kidnapped being put up to saying whatever it is they want to say being paid two thousand dollars equivalent. And I'm pretty everyone. I'm pretty sure everyone that affects gets cash. It's a program that exists. Uh, for every nation that is directly bucking U.S. imperialism. Exactly. That program uh, goes back. I mean, literally, that's where the, oh, the slaves, uh, uh, Africans uh, sold themselves into slavery propaganda comes from. There were literally kidnapped Africans who were brainwashed by the state, manipulated and tortured into spreading that propaganda so that the U.S. never had to address um, that its culpability in slavery. They tried to make it a both sides were wrong kind of issue. This is this this is the kind of logic that we're dealing with when we're talking about the um, the way the state acts. So the idea that the state wouldn't intervene and wouldn't pay people to lie is just a historical. They've been doing it to Africans for a couple hundred years now. They've been doing it to uh, people from the south for the last well over half a century now, and that's not something. Uh, that's not something that they'll ever stop doing as long as uh, the bourgeois liberal state exists. So we have to always keep in mind who these actors are. And we should never dismiss anything totally. But we just have to do a real analysis on who's saying what, because that's the only way you come anywhere close to the truth. You know, and oftentimes, you know, you might have somebody who has a legitimate gripe, and that might be worth discussing when that comes out. But more often than not, what you hear 
the worst of what you hear anyway. It's just often just horseshit. And the people who are saying it aren't to blame. I mean, if you got, if, if you, who knows what you can get me to say if you floated like that much money in front of me, you know, when I'm when, as poor as I am. And, you know, oftentimes these people are a hell of a lot poorer than even I am. I'm pretty goddamn poor. So uh, we shouldn't begrudge the folks who end up doing it because, I mean, motherfuckers got families to take care of and shit, you know what I mean? Uh, Clarkin says, I'm pretty sure that the, everyone in the fix gets cash, definitely. We should also, in general, be mindful of a few individuals of the country being the only ones saying things. It's worth looking into Yasha Levine's weaponized immigrant thesis. Uh, let's see. I'm going to find that, and I'm going to get that link, because everybody should read that shit. Uh, I don't have it bookmarked like I thought I did, but I will definitely look into uh, making sure that y'all get a hold of that, because it's very important. What do you mean, Aaron? A good example of propaganda uh, being waged against it? And, uh, I mean, Fanon talks about the weaponized immigrant. I mean, he talk, he refers to the weaponized immigrant as the, uh, and I suppose in his case, he's talking about locals and not settlers. But he's talking about, he, he talks about the, uh, the native intellectual often and how they're often weaponized against, the, uh, against their own people in order to in order to spread the interest of the state. Okay, yeah, I found that. Uh, here we go. Yeah, I just shared it with Emily. She'll get that weaponized immigrants thesis to y'all shortly. Yeah, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and wrap it up here, y'all. But um, it was real good spending time with y'all. I really endured, enjoyed uh, answering the questions and going over the uh, presentation. Yeah, y'all take care. I love y'all comrades. Y'all have a good night. Solidarity always. Take care.